Good morning. I know some people just joined us. We have Liz and Melissa and Zach and somebody's name who I'm going to butcher. I'm going to say it's Sriram. Sriram? Am I saying that right? Tell me how to say your name. Yeah, that's correct. Fabulous. Sweet Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> All right, it's 9.03. Um, we gave everybody a couple more minutes to hop on late. I'm sure people will continue to join us, but we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Amy. Uh, I am the productivity coach. Well, I'm the outgoing productivity coach at KW Vaca Valley, as well as the broker over there and an active agent in production. Um, I just moved, so I'm, that's why I'm on the outgoing productivity coach, as I'm getting ready to pass the torch on that as I have moved out of the area. So somebody else will be taking up my torch there at KW Vaca Valley. Um, so I'm excited to be teaching today. I have a couple of rules. One is I try really hard to watch the chat, but I'm not very good at it. So if you have something to say, just unmute yourself or raise your hand on your little screen. If you don't know how to do that, usually you can like hover over your picture. There's like three little dots and it'll allow you to raise your hand or you can just interrupt me. I'm completely interruptible. I like my classes to be interactive. I'd like you to ask questions, ask for clarification. Um, so feel free just to interrupt me. Just be like, hey, Amy, or hey, I have something to say. Totally okay. Don't think it's rude. Um, feel free to, to blurt it out at any moment in time. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to holler at me. How is everyone's Ignite experience going? This is the last session. How do you feel about Ignite? Hi, Amy, this is Deepak. Um, I think Ignite is great. I mean, uh, this is a program which is much needed for all the new agents and maybe even not for, even for the not so new agents. I mean, uh, in the last like what, 19, 20 hours, there's so much experience and so much knowledge which is condensed and presented to us. Uh, I think if we go on and try to do the research and gather all this knowledge by ourselves, it will take us a long, long time. So really grateful to Keller Williams for having this program. Fabulous. Yeah, I can add something onto that. So I think even after attending each of these sessions, every session emphasizes on keeping contact with your leads all the time, continuously. Absolutely. One more person. How's your night experience going? I'm very patient, so I can wait for a really long time for somebody else to unmute themselves and share how their night experience is going. We'd just like to get a little feedback. I'd like to see how everybody's doing this morning. Get you used to hitting that unmute button. You can hold the space bar down too. That'll unmute you temporarily until you let go of it. It's been an eye-opening experience for me. Fabulous. It's Thank not you just for what, uh, It's... It, it fills in the gaps. It's kind of like ice cream, you know, uh, you get full from dinner, but you can fill in the gaps with ice cream. We get all the training that we get from our local uh, centers, but Ignite is filling in all the gaps. Perfect. Perfect. What I really like about this Ignite series is it's the three market centers coming together. So you guys got to hear from a bunch of different instructors from different market centers, which is always fun. Um, if the opportunity to participate in Ignite comes up again, I recommend that you do it because every time you participate, and especially when you have different instructors teaching the sessions, you're going to pick up different tips and tricks and little things that you'll be able to carry with you and little ahas that you'll be able to put into practice. So um, I'm excited to have you join me today. Again, feel free if you have questions or need clarification on something or want to add, feel free to interrupt me. Um, we are covering contract to close today. Um, super exciting. We've been, you know, your Spark experience was um, figuring out how to set the appointments, getting your basis covered, um, you know, figuring out all those fundamentals. And then as we've moved into elementals, it's putting that stuff into practice with our buyer presentations, our seller presentations, um, you know, walking through those appointments, showing the properties. And now we've talked about 
getting your property in the contract. And now we're in contract. What do we do? Contract to close is what we'll be covering today. And you guys can see my screen, correct? Yes, yes. we can. Perfect. All right. So um, what we're going to focus on today, as we've, I'm sure you've talked about in every other session, we have the grow the business and the run the business. Today, we're focusing on running your business, negotiating those contracts, transaction management to closing, vendor management, compliance risk management, all those really fun, exciting things. Um, so we'll plug away on to that. So um, here is our timeline for today. We're going to talk about building buyer and seller timelines, best practices for managing the deal, command transaction management. We're going to talk about a recap and your success list, and then end the day with your daily success habits. Um, give me some ideas of things that can help make your transaction successful or not successful? Give me three things that could help lead either to a successful transaction or an unsuccessful transaction. Making sure all the documents are submitted on time and keeping track of the deadlines for each and every contingency or whatever is supposed to happen. Perfect, uh, absolutely. Uh, constant communication with the agent on the other side as well as the lender and all the parties involved. Absolutely. Um, I would add anticipating potential things that could be hiccups, like, for example, appraisal gaps or things like that. Just anticipating ahead of time, making sure it's in the contract. Anticipating or ahead. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, follow up step by step. Don't leave anything behind. Perfect. Very good. Thank you for your participation. I appreciate it. So yeah, absolutely, right? There's lots of things that are going to add to a successful transaction and help prevent that transaction from going astray. Um, so we have buyer timelines, right? So we want to make sure we build a buyer timeline. And something that I can share with you guys after the session, I'm not exactly sure how to do it. Hold on, let me um, figure out how to get my screen where I can see the top toolbars. Mm -hmm. Hold on. I put it into full screen mode and then there we go. Wait. And then what happened was it has my zoom screen covering my tabbies. All right, there we go. So if you guys want, I'm happy to share this with you um, after the session, I'll figure out how to get it out to you all. But I have a fabulous um, transaction action plan. It's got two tabbies, one for the purchase and one for the listing. So it's important in, to build out kind of what that time frame, what that contract to close process looks like. So you can make sure you're following along those milestones, like was mentioned, making sure we know like where are the deadlines, what deadlines are we even looking for as a new agent you're gonna kind of feel lost for your first few transactions, um, maybe even into several transactions because every transaction operates so differently. But we kind of put together this um, timeline where it can um, outline for you and you just kind of check it off. This would be like an ideal world. This is how the transaction would flow. So once we're in contract, um, so it's got the getting started, the offer process, and then into contract, um, your kind of your time frame. There's so many little steps as you move into the buyer transaction and what needs to happen on the buyer side of that process, um, right? So from acknowledging the offer, opening escrow, send the RPA encounters to the lender, um, send an intro email through um, for the buyer inspection elections and um, getting the, escrow, the deposit to escrow. So all those little teeny tiny steps this one kind of breaks it down handy. And obviously what you guys do in your market center or your area is gonna be a little different than what um, we might do, although they should be pretty similar because we're all in the state of California. So do you guys think this would be helpful to have a buyer transaction timeframe? Yes. Yes. <laughs> all right. So some major things, right? Some, um, it was mentioned, number one, try to anticipate things ahead of time, which is good. And this will help you kind of see what's coming up, make sure that we're staying on track, and then also make sure you adhere to those timeframes. So we want to make sure that we always have a clear um, 
a clear idea of when our contingencies are due, when the close of escrow is supposed to happen, if that deal is being financed, right? We need to know when would the CD, that closing disclosure, need to be issued by the lender in order to allow us to close on time, right? It needs to probably go out at least five days prior to the close of escrow. So there's a few things that need to happen. Um, th this is where, you know, you've got on the Ignite package, it's gonna talk about, you know, executing a contract, working with the lender, right? So it just kind of gives you a vague where we can break it down item by item um, so that we can have that information at our fingertips. Does anybody have questions about what should be on a buyer timeframe? No, no questions. I mean, what do you mean by buyer? What do you mean by that? Like what a should buyer. be on your list to do? Yeah, what should be on your to-do list? Like transferring the deposit, the, yep. the first after the offer acceptance, then ordering the inspection and making sure the inspection report is available before the uh, deadline. Absolutely. Uh, also, first, yeah, first of all, you want to make sure they are pre-approved or how they are financing, whether they're paying cash down or if they are uh, taking a loan, if the loan, what's the limit and all that stuff. You also want to educate them with kind, kind of give them an estimate of how, what would be the approximate mortgage and stuff like that. So they are mentally prepared for what's coming. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Also yeah, the ahead. inspection contingencies and Absolutely. the appraisal and the loan all include. Absolutely. <laughs> Make sure um, those one more thing. Yeah. So one more thing I, I would like to add is to have to uh, get a backup um, lender in case um, things fall out. For the from the um, you know the first lender, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're unfamiliar with that lender or you you um, you know aren't familiar with their processes, having that backup lender in place that's a great idea to help prevent anything from going astray in the transaction and mm -hmm. providing your buyer with that backup plan, right? So that yeah, if it falls apart, we're not struggling in the middle of the transaction to figure out what do we do mm -hmm. next. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, let's see here. I was just double checking. We're going to come, um, well, we're going to swing back. Give me some possible things that can go wrong in a buyer transaction. There could be a number of things. Uh, the appraisal could come in lower, so they'll okay. have to, uh, yeah, uh, take care of the gap, and they might not have that much uh, to fill up. I mean, uh, sometimes when they're maxing out on their down payment at the appraisal comes low, then there is uh, this difficult uh, situation of how to fill, it, fill in that gap. So that could be one of the things. Um, you could also find some unknowns during the inspections. Okay. Uh, so uh, you're back on the negotiation table with the sellers. Um, so, so many other different things, but <laughs> I'll let others <laughs> chip in. Absolutely. For something um, like the appraisal coming in low, what are some best practices that we could do to help keep that transaction alive? Uh, but by negotiation with the seller. Okay, perfect. Doing a CMA and talking about um, what it you know, could be valued at with the buyer before they decide on purchase price. And then also coming up with some type of appraisal clause or verbiage to prepare for, um, you know, possibly a cash over appraisal agreement. Okay, perfect. I like it. I think that, um, you know, going into it before we even write an offer, right? Like you just said about uh, supplying that CMA report, kind of giving our opinion of where we think that appraisal is going to land. So they know whether they're offering over where we think it's going to be or kind of where we think that appraisal is going to hit um, is a good idea 
Uh, absolutely. And then also um, kind of pre-planning. And then you had mentioned the appraisal gap, right? Um, making sure we have that, like if they can come over with cash above appraisal. And even if we don't write it into the offer, knowing what our buyers are capable of would be really helpful, right? Yeah, I think a um, plan ahead for the appraisal gap is very important. I had the case, yeah, we had a um, about yeah, some um, appraisal gap. So um, we knew this could happen like a couple months ago and market really hot. So then I, yeah, we um, just talked to the buyers. So they, they um, have planned to sell more um, company stocks in case, um, you know, appraisal fall short. So, yeah. and then they did. <laughs> so always plan ahead. Yeah. Always plan ahead. Absolutely. And like you said, you knew what your buyer was capable of going into it. So I think that's huge. Yeah. Um, two, one of the things, just so you know, what we've started doing, kind of what we've been training our agents to do is on our appraisal gap, right? Which is where you come in with your offer and you say, hey, if the appraisal comes in low, my buyer's willing to pay 20000 or 30000 or 100000 over appraised value, um, not to exceed contract price. One of the things that we've changed a little bit in our verbiage of that appraisal gap on the contract because I've run into a couple of issues where there's some gray area um, and we're trying to avoid, you know, holding things up in a legal process is we've changed the verbiage to read, um, you know, if the appraisal comes in below contract price, buyer and seller agree that sales price will be 10,000 or 30,000 or whatever that gap is over the appraised value not to exceed the contract price. And I've added that verbiage of buyer and seller agree that sales final sales price will be, because now we have it in writing that this is what we have agreed to. Not just that the buyer is willing to pay 20,000 over the appraised value, but that the seller agrees that that's gonna be the final sales price. So we, because we've had some issues where sellers go, well, I didn't think it was going to come in that low and now I want to cancel. And that's the buyer agreeing to come in, but that's not the seller agreeing to sell. And so we've kind of changed it up a little bit to help avoid that hiccup. Even though I've talked to Car Legal and I was told that even with the buyer agreeing that that kind of locks everybody in, but it becomes this kind of gray area where we've had people fight us on it. So um, changing that verbiage to be the buyer and seller agree that the final sales price will be X number of dollars over appraised value not to exceed a contract price. And that not to exceed contract price is super important as well, because if you've guaranteed 20,000 over appraised value and we don't have not to exceed contract price and it comes in $1,000 below contract value, um, you're obligated to spend 20,000 over that if we don't have that cap in place. So just a couple things in there. Um, how about with repairs? What are some ways to help avoid um, repair issues or best practices to deal with um, uh, some major items that come up on inspections as part of that transaction? Uh, you could put in a clause to have the seller repair them before the close of escrow. Okay. We could ask the seller to repair them, absolutely. Um, I usually put the repair cost into an addendum um, okay. so that it will not um, impact the, the lenders, you know, the COE. So the lender will re need to re-inspect before the repair complete, right? So that sometimes it takes a very long time. So I just uh, put the possible, um, you know, the cost a month into an yeah, addendum. Okay. And is that after you've negotiated an amount for the repairs? Yeah. Okay, perfect. I had one case actually. Uh, um, we agreed to put that um, because uh, um, the supp supply issue at the, for example, there was a door and the closet door uh, was broken. So it, and the seller um, had already ordered the door from China somehow the order from Home Depot, but the door came from China, right? So in, in the last year, right? So it was, it, there's issues in supplies, right? So it take, um, it said they will anticipate to take over two months to come in. So what can we do? We cannot let that hold our COE, right? So yeah. we agreed to put that item into addendum, just like uh, even after COE, 
um, we still we still need to uh, track about this item. So, but then so this one was not known to the well the the lender doesn't I mean we didn't let the lender know about this. Like, we just put in a separate um separate addendum. So yeah. So, yeah, uh, so do you, in that case, do you reduce the selling price or do you give? No, like, the selling the price is still, no, the um, the seller, because it was a really hot seller market, right? Mm -hmm. So the seller will not, um, they did not agree to reduce the the price because they already ordered the, um, the door before the sale. So we had to agree. <laughs> So you just had it agreed that the door would be installed after the close of escrow, Yeah, correct? you install after the COE, yeah. It, it is a hassle, but yeah, mm -hmm. that at that kind of market, we had to agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And paying attention to things, um, obviously not a closet door. You, could have, you couldn't have had anticipated that it would take that long for the door to come in. But mm -hmm. you're showing properties, right? Paying attention to what the condition of the property is. So you kind of know what might come up in those inspection reports. Like it's okay showing mm -hmm. properties to mess with the AC or to, you know, run the water to see if the hot water heater is working. So you can kind of see some of those systems and components, especially in a really hot seller's market where, you know, the seller's probably not going to comply with a lot of repair requests. Mm -hmm. um, so you're really just looking for those major deal breakers. Um, testing some of those components as you're showing the property is completely acceptable if they don't have any pre-inspections on file. Perfect. Those were some great um, ideas. Um, let's see, what about um, the uh, contingency timeframes? We talked about kind of making sure those contingency timeframes were on your transaction. Um, timeline. So just making sure you're aware of those so you can um, meet those deadlines. We usually have like an appraisal contingency, loan contingency, and the inspection contingency. I know in the new contract, there's actually eight separate contingencies because they've kind of broken them down with the seller review of disclosure or the review of seller disclosures, um, prelim, lease, and lead items. So they've kind of broken it down, but we kind of wrap that all in under buyer investigation. Um, so just making sure you're staying aware and on top of those contingency timeframes. What's a good idea of ways to stay on top of those timeframes? Uh, be in constant touch with uh, the people who are actually responsible for providing you information to remove the contingency, like the inspector, the lender, the appraiser and stuff. Perfect. To make sure they have, it, they have it scheduled and this is the timeline when they are expected to complete it. This is the timeline where they're expected to turn in the paperwork and stuff. Absolutely. Um, for inspections, I have scheduled them before our offer was even accepted um, with the thought like, you know, I can just cancel it if it doesn't work out, but at least it's um, scheduled in advance. And then uh, included in my offer summary that, you know, we have these inspections lined up and set for the state so that we're serious about making the deadlines. Um, Perfect. And then also, you know, talking with the lender in advance to make sure that those contingency deadlines are doable for the loan and the appraisal. Absolutely. And pre-scheduling scheduling those inspections is a huge one, especially as we shorten those inspection contingency timeframes, making sure that the inspectors can actually get in there and kind of pre-scheduling them is a great idea. Um, how about adding those contingency timeframes to your calendar with reminders that pop up, you know, 48 hours in advance and 24 hours in advance to keep you ahead of the game and keep that reminder on track? Yeah, that's a great idea, yeah. Just oversees uh, everything after the offer <laughs> get accepted, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or like a project um, program manager. <laughs> <laughs> you are a project manager, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the hardest part is uh, is still with the lender, uh, especially when the buyer uh, choose their own lender, right? You are not familiar with their work style, and also you know how you know how they handle things. How you know, there's it's very hard to track their schedule, so you have to. Uh, really, you know, you know, stay on top of it, keep following up, re, um, you know, just keep, just follow up. Yeah. follow up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
especially like you said, when you're not familiar with their style or um, you're having problems getting in touch with them. Yeah, I also think it's it's extremely important. Like I have um, I have some uh, lenders that 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 I have been worked with. I know um, they can they can deliver on time. Sometimes they they just feel like they act like a firefighter, right? So I have those backup lenders in case things doesn't work out with my buyer's lender. I will just uh, uh, recommend them just. Um, <laughs> get out and then switch to a different lender um, to meet the um, the deadline. Absolutely. Um, a couple other things that were on the, the build a buyer timeline was home insurance, home warranty, right? The close. Um, something that I send out as well, which I can also get you guys a copy is this buyer intro email. So once we enter into contract, I like to keep the buyer updated. Hey, here's the things that you should expect. Here's what's coming. Um, here's what to anticipate. And so it just says, hey, over the next few days, it's going to feel a little crazy, maybe a little overwhelming. Um, you know, just let me know, just let you know that I'm here for you. If you have any questions, concerns, or just need help, let me know. I introduce my transaction coordinator. So once you hire a transaction coordinator, I introduce them so that they know they're going to get correspondence, not just from me, but from other people regarding this transaction. Um, we also always set up our files in Homelight Listing Management. So that's one of the free tools we have through Berries. Um, it allows you to create files. Um, in fact, let me see if I can open. Give me just a second. Open up a new tabby. Um, let disclosures IO. So I'll show you what I do with my buyer transactions because I create a file for um, not just my listings, but my buyers. And I, I run my buyers in as a um, listing transaction in Homelight Listing Management. So um, like this one here is a purchase transaction and I, we just create a file for that. And then anything we get that has to do with this file and I share it with my buyers, I also share it with the other agent we throw in here. So as we get the home inspection in, we throw it in this file and it gives you the ability to um, update viewers of, um, notify viewers of updates. But this is one way to keep everything kind of clear. All those seller disclosures, the prelim, the title or the um, NHD report, the inspections, um, anything that comes in with this file that I think my buyer would need to be kept aware of, we throw into this home light listing management. Instead of sending emails back and forth, that get lost and then they're like, oh, well, let me go search for that home that home inspection again. They can just log into Homelight Listing Management and get a copy of that um, document right in here, the CCNRs, the buyer's inspection election, prelim. So it's all in here ready to go for them. And then they can download this entire thing at the end and have a complete copy of everything that was in the file. So that's one of the tools that I use to kind of help me manage um, and keep the buyer aware of everything that's going on. Once we get close to that um, inspection or investigation, the seller disclosures, all of that, those contingency timeframes, then we take all this stuff and send it out to them for signatures. But this way they have a time to review it and check it out. So is it, has anybody used Home Light Listing Management before? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I've used it just to view disclosures on um, properties that are for sale. Uh-huh. So yeah, so you can create your own file in there. And like I said, I create even my, my buyer transactions as listings because as listings, you have more freedom to kind of tweak and add and share it than you do with creating a new buyer transaction. So I create it as a listing, um, which allows you to add those documents, add viewers, um, add different agents to it. So it's kind of a neat setting as long as you use that workaround to set it up as a seller transaction. Okay. The clients can also log in here and view all the docs. The, yep, the clients can view, log in and view all the docs. So you just hit share package. Um, you put your buyer in there <coughs> and you put their name and email. You hit share and then they get a link to view that, that package. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great tool. Um, so we'll hop back over to so this buyer email that I send out, right? So I let them know that, hey, you're going to get a link for Home Light Listing Management where you can view all the documents, disclosures, inspections. Um, then I talk about the deposit. I remind them what the deposit, how much it is and where it needs to go to. <coughs> Excuse me. I ask them how they want that they can either, you know, make it via personal check, cashier's check or wire transfer. 
And then we usually send over the wire transfer instructions with this. Um, loan docs here, I let them know that, hey, I'm gonna send everything over to the lender. They're gonna be in contact with you to sign all your initial disclosures and get that loan process rolling along. <coughs> insurance, right? Call your, call your um, insurance agent to get a homeowner's insurance quote because we don't want to be like have the closing held up because we haven't taken care of that homeowner's insurance yet. As well as, um, especially up in the Vacaville area, you start getting further out into the country and now we've got the high fire hazard zones and higher insurance costs. And so we want to make sure that everything's agreeable to our buyers and affordable for them. So we make sure that they do that right off the get-go um, while we're still within that physical inspection contingency period. And then we talk about inspections and I list all the different types of inspections that I would recommend for this property and what the approximate cost is, let them know they're all optional. And then I also say, hey, there's lots of others too. So if there's something that you don't think would be covered by one of these up here, just let me know and we can get that taken care of. Um, I also let them know that they can be at the house during the time of inspections. I ask them for their schedule. And this all goes out right at the beginning when we enter into contract. So that just helps keep the buyer aware of what's going on, right? Communication. Yeah, looks great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I like this uh, communication. Oh, so, yeah. so after... After offer get accepted, you just compose this, send this email to the buyer, explain to them everything good. Yep. And so, and then we updated this. So I've got this set up for, um, in fact, all the productivity coaching clients that they have a copy mm -hmm. of this and they can use it as well. And so that's why it has like insert loan officer's name or yeah. insert transaction coordinator's name. So, um, so it goes over all that information for them. So super handy there. Um, as far as, you know, making sure that we stay on top of everything and have the buyer working on their side of what needs to get done from the beginning so that we don't have any holdups. All right. Perfect. Seller timeline, same thing, right? So we have our buyer's timeline. When we're doing a listing, we're going to have that seller timeline. So on that um, Google sheet that I showed you that I told you I'd share with you guys on the bottom, there's a tab for the listing. And here we've got the same timeline situated for the listing transaction flow from listing appointment to pre-listing to active to offers to once we're in contract, right? And um, with sellers, it's kind of an interesting dynamic in that we're in a really good communication with them up front while we're doing getting the pre-listing situated, while we're getting the listing on the market, while we're showing the property, you know, we receive offers. And then for those few, first few days, it's like getting all those inspections scheduled, getting the appraisal scheduled, whatever needs to happen. And then for a seller, then it kind of dies off, right? And they're like, hey, what's going on? Where Are you still out there? We've been talking all the time. And now I feel like we've kind of like, is it still going okay? So what are some ways we can keep some sell our sellers updated of what's going on? Anybody have some ideas of making sure our sellers are assured of that we're still working for them? Um, keeping them engaged and keeping them abreast of what's going on. Perfect. Uh, how about if we set, if we're keeping them updated of what's going on, what if we set expectations of when they're going to hear from us next? Do you think that would be helpful in just assuring them that they're not missing something? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So kind of setting that expectation. Um, on the seller side, there's lots of things um, that you have to do as well, right? But a lot of it's behind the scenes. It's ordering those NHD reports. It's um, making sure escrow got opened. It's following up with the buyer's lender. It's following up with the buyer's agent, right? So it's all those kind of behind the scenes things. So I think um, just keeping those sellers engaged and updated along the way would help and letting them setting that expectation of when we're going to connect up with them. Um, hey, Amy, I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with communicating with the sellers, are there platforms that are used to that? I mean, I don't know, that can support that, or is it just, you know, a text or a call? Does that make sense? What I'm asking? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 
Um, so in your, um, which I, we're going to try to touch on here in a little bit, in commands, you can set up tasks and timelines um, inside of your opportunities. And it allows you to set some of those that when they're completed, it updates the um, party, whether it's your buyer or your seller of those items have been completed. And that would be one way to kind of keep them updated as you check things off your to-do list. So you can take this list that I've got here on the spreadsheet and put it into your command opportunities and then set some of those items up for um, to notify the seller that they've been completed. Cool, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll kind of cover that here in the last like 10 minutes or so of the class or last 15 minutes. Okay. Um, so some things that seller needs to be aware of, right? As the listing agent, you want to make sure that you're on um, the ball with getting those seller disclosures completed. So making sure that those um, are done. I like to have my sellers complete their, their seller disclosures the week before we go on the market. That way they're done and ready to go for any potential buyers, especially in a hotter market. It allows buyers to make a non-contingent offer with regards to seller disclosures because they've already been provided those disclosures in advance. Um, I think down in your guys' area, it's a little more um, common practice for that to happen. Is that correct? I think yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, uh, the further north you go, the less common practice it becomes. So like Vacaville, Solano County, we're kind of like the cutoff for the Bay Area of like, it's probably 50% of the time you can get a hold of the seller disclosures. <laughs> uh -oh, I just kicked my desk, sorry. Um, so making sure those disclosures are done up front. What about, um, can we prevent um, mishaps from taking place by having pre-inspections done or uh, pre-listing inspections completed? Yes, for sure. For sure. Absolutely. What would be one way to convince your seller or to have a conversation with your seller about the importance of having them paying for those pre-listing inspections? It reduces the possibility of transaction uh, falling out uh, if uh, during the escrow during the contingency period, if the buyer discovers something that uh, drastic dr uh, that needs major repairs, uh, and if they are not willing to continue with the transaction, then you risk fall fall uh, risk the transaction falling out. Absolutely, so, right? Yeah. Totally makes sense. Like, hey, get these done so that we know what to expect and the buyers know what is going on with the property. Absolutely. Anybody else have some tips or tricks to making sure that your seller agrees to have those pre-listing inspections completed? Um, some wise person taught me that you just tell them that, you know, I always tell my sellers, like, let's be transparent up front. And so that way your buyers can come in with a solid offer because they already know what repairs they're gonna to have to do or what you're not gonna do. So it really helps them to get a solid offer in instead of having to deal with more than negotiations, finding out later, oh, we need a new heater. Absolutely. Um, how about appraisals, right? That's another area where we have issues come in is with our appraisals. We kind of talked about that from the buyer side. But how do we help to prevent low appraisals on the seller side? Anybody got some ideas? Price appropriately. Price appropriately. And both sometimes our buyers still, even with pricing appropriately, the buyers like to go way above asking, right? right? Mm -hmm. And even though there might be an appraisal guarantee there, we still want to be putting in as high as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Being there for the appraisal and preparing that CMA or whatever resources you can provide the appraiser with. Absolutely. I have a question though, kind of backtracking, yeah. sorry. <laughs> With the inspections, what kind of, cause I, I know like not every listing has inspections done up front. Some do and some don't. What kind of objections are most common for sellers not wanting to get it done? Is it just cost or are they like afraid to know what will show up on the report or what are the most common objections? Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's both a house the seller didn't pay for the inspections i had to pay for them pay for inspections for my buy for a potential buyer and um, i think it's probably one of the most common ones 
questions. And then also they kind of have that mentality of like, don't ask, don't tell, right? If you don't know it's a problem, we don't have to disclose it, but people are going to find out anyways. Anybody else hear any other objections to not getting those pre-listing inspections completed? No, and I think that to either of those, that original, um, what Dipak said about the uh, inspections being completed, right? What he kind of talked about of how to get your sellers to agree to it, making sure that, hey, this allows us to kind of make sure that there's no unknown items that come up in that inspection period, which would allow a buyer to walk. This sets us up for success so that once we secure a buyer, that buyer is going to close on that transaction. And also, we're more likely to get a transaction, a buyer who's willing to go with no inspection contingency if those things are already completed, right, would be how to handle those. Um, with regards to the appraisal, I compare, I complete an appraisal packet for all of my appraisals, um, which allows me to um, identify on the property kind of what the features are, whether the appraiser actually gives them value or not. So I've got one pulled up right now, the example, I let them know what we're in contract for. I let them know that if we received multiple offers, how many offers we received. If we received like more than three, I usually put the number of offers and whether they were at or above asking. Um, if I received like two or three offers, then I would just say multiple offers received because I want the appraiser to, to think that we're amazing. Um, so it just depends <laughs> how many, right? So it's all in how you tell the story. And then I list all the features of the property, like how big is the property? How many bedrooms? How, ba how many bathrooms? Does it have a pool? Does it have a spa? Does it have a patio cover? Is it landscaped? Does it have solar? Does it have, is its location unique? Is it in a court? Does it back open space? Um, is it one of the larger lots in the neighborhood? You know, what are all of those? Um, these this old new electric service panel 2017, new roof in 2018. So I put the year there for the appraiser so that they can start. I will summarize the property here and why it might be unique. Like this one was right next door to the park. Um, it had a bonus room downstairs that could have been a fifth bedroom, den, office. So right, so I'm just going to summarize the property and just embellish it and make it look as amazing as possible. And then I handpick all of my comparables for the property. So what do I want them to use that's going to help me get my value? And is there a comparable um, next door, like this one, 189 Clayton Circle, which was a model method, 375, we were in contract at like 475. And I wasn't hesitant to address it in here. It's the closest recent model match. However, it's not a usable comp. It was a bank owned property that had no updates, no landscaping and needed substantial work. So I'm going to point that out because that's the first thing the appraiser is going to look at is what's nearby that's like the same square footage or model match. And that's going to be the most recent comp. So why would we not want to use that one? I would put that one in here as well. And I compare the properties, right? So like uh, Tulare Drive, this home is similar in size, condition, has a pool and owns solar. This home was in a flood zone, required flood insurance, whereas the subject property is not. And the subject property is superior location being next to Creekside Park. So I just make those connections. In addition to this, I include copies of the one page appraisal report from the MLS for those comparable properties and the subject property. And then I also include a copy of the purchase agreement because I have had in the past where we had a um, appraiser come out that didn't get a copy of the counter offers and appraised the property based on the wrong sales price. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Luckily it was an easy fix, but <laughs> Uh, so I like to kind of take it and then like direct them and help the appraiser do their job. I get mixed reviews from appraisers on this, but when I've used this, I've yet to have a low appraisal come in if, if I can justify the value for them. Do you think this would be helpful to provide an appraiser? I have a uh, general question. Since the contract... The appraiser is an ind independent contractor, right? They they work independently. We should we should not uh, influence them, right? Oh, I if I'm in charge of that listing and I'm trying to get the most money possible for my sellers out of that listing, 
I absolutely will include a packet and hand off to them during the appraisal. I'm doing oh, my fiduciary it, responsibility yeah. to my seller. Okay. So, so during appraisal, um, listen, so you usually be there with the appraiser. Yeah. So you hand I, this package to him. Okay. Yep. I put it in a sealed envelope. I write on there, you know, mm -hmm. drive appraisal and I hand it off to them while we're at the, the appraisal. I see. Yep. Amy, do can you um, select your own appraiser? You cannot. So you get okay. whatever the vendor puts it into the system. They'll put the appraisal request okay. into the appraisal system. Uh, an appraiser will pick it up and you kind of get what you get. Um, so yeah, and sometimes they're out of area appraisers and sometimes they're local. And so I make sure to kind of protect my sellers. I will also provide this <coughs> for my buyers as well. If we've got an appraisal guarantee in place and where my, my buyers are potentially coming out of pocket with more mm -hmm. cash, I will provide the same packet on the buyer side as well and meet the appraisal the appraiser there. So who do you provide the packet to? To the appraiser? To the appraiser. Okay. And what does the packet contain? The CMAs? So it contains this kind of little synopsis that I do. Um, I can provide you guys with a copy of this as well. Um, and then the comparables that I've chosen, I can include a one page. It's in Barry's, it's a one page appraisal, appraisal report um, that details the information from the MLS on those properties and then a copy of the purchase contract and any counter offers. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So Amy, at the end, uh, uh, we're going to get your uh, slides, right? Can we? Yeah, I think at the end, I'll make sure to um, to, to send over um, to Abigail or whoever's in charge of it all these documents that she can send. Oh, out. that's nice. Guys yeah, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. I'm all about sharing. Sharing is caring. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's um, very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, what are some other, can you guys think of any other things that might come up as part of the seller transaction that could cause problems with closing? What about a situation where the seller is just like, I changed my mind. I don't want to sell anymore. I mean, is that, that that's happened, right? It During does happen. It does happen. So the seller, the buyer is protected from that happening in that the seller can't just cancel a contract. So if the seller decides, hey, I don't want to sell anymore, I, we really want to stay outside of having like a um, seller contingency, like the seller's contingency for the purchase of a replacement property or something to that effect, the seller can't cancel the contract. Um, so if the seller was really adamant, it might be a conversation with the buyer about, hey, the seller, um, like they're really having remorse about putting their house on the market. Would you be willing to, um, you know, cancel the contract? Chances are the buyer's going to be like, no, sorry, like too bad, so sad, seller. <laughs> so um, the, the way that the seller can get around that is by holding the buyer accountable to those timeframes in the contract, right? So we have certain deadlines that have to be met, the, the um, inspection contingency, appraisal contingency, loan contingency being removed. They have the um, return of the seller's documents, right? All the disclosures, the buyer actually has to return those in a certain period of time. We are supposed to get proof of deposit or and proof of, there's like several little timeframes in there. Um, so if you look at that, that notice to perform form that's in your car forms library, anything on that buyer notice to perform is something that the seller could, could do a 24 hour or 48 hour notice to perform to the buyers. And if they don't um, provide what was supposed to be provided, then the seller can cancel the contract. That is the only way the seller can cancel legally. Okay, good to know. Not yeah. that I know that'll ever happen. But it sounds like a standoff. <laughs> it does happen, yes. The buyer can do for specific performance, which is the buyer can force the seller's hand in selling that property if they're in contract and they've abided by all the time frames in the contract. I see. Okay, thanks. Yep, absolutely. Um, on that note too, as a listing agent, I hold people responsible to removing those contingencies on, on time. Don't 
hesitate ever to serve that notice to perform and just be like, hey, Jenny, um, I just want to let you know, like the inspection contingencies due in the next couple of days, I'm going to send over a notice to perform perform we're on track moving forward or it's not a little attack on you it's just part of my deal in part in protecting my sellers right so as a listing agent like um there's nothing wrong with serving that notice to perform to keeping those buyers on track and moving forward you may wait until it's due you may wait a couple days in advance it's totally up to you and how you decide to do that but make sure you keep those buyers on track and that they actually remove those contingencies um on the buyer side of things I'm going to drag my feet out and keep those contingencies in place as long as that other agent will let me. I sometimes will force their hand in serving a notice to perform because if something happens, my buyer changes their mind on day 18, we were supposed to remove the contingency on day 10, and we still have that floating around out there, then we have the right to cancel still. So um, I leave those contingencies floating around out there forever. There's eight. transaction from versus a listing agent. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. All right. Um, we talked about, um, there was an activity in your book where we kind of worked through that um, together about where's the deal going to fall apart, best practices to keep it alive. We kind of talked about that as we talked about those timeframes. Um, what are some ways, um, there's an activity, plot communication points. What are some ways that we can, well, in fact, we're going to skip over this activity because it's 9.54. And we're going to hop in what Tara asked about, um, hey, how do we keep um, on top of everything? And how do we keep our clients updated? So if you log into command... Inside of your opportunity, it's currently really slow. There we go. All right, so inside opportunities, um, if you open up your opportunities, which you should be tracking your buyers and sellers through the opportunity time frame, and you can um, cut these time frames inside of these opportunities. So um, making sure you're aware of that. Let me kind of shrink your little window down. Um, give me just a second for it to load. All right, so let's open up um, buyer's transactions. So as soon as you have a buyer that's kind of looking at moving into this process, you're trying to set an appointment with them, you want to put them into your um, cultivate. So these top ones up here, cultivate appointment active under contract and closed, you can't change. But in here, you can absolutely um, edit these stages by just clicking the edit stages button inside. So I have like connect, nurture, zero to three months, six months, um, if you go to appointment, you can go scheduled, scheduling confirmed, right? So as you move them through the process, once you've got an active deal, I have on hold, like somebody who was moving forward and they went backwards, lender of pre-approval, searching or showing, writing offers, negotiations, right? And then we have under contract. So in here, you can make these as specific as you want. I've got under contract, inspections, appraisal, financing, repair request, clear to close, right? And inside of here, there are different tasks. So as you move people through these different stages, yes, you can love. see here that you can set up with tasks. Uh -huh. And it gives you a checklist that you can check off. So um, you can add items or you can set it up as a default. Has anybody used the tasks inside of opportunities? No, I have not. Not in this no. way. No, not, not in opportunities. Way. Just just under like contact and then I click task. Yeah. But I have it in here. Oops, hold on. I clicked on the wrong thing. 
Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, so inside tasks, so, and you can edit those different tasks in there. So here's your edit stages button. That's a lot more pre uh, 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 acceptable. And then, um, a minute. All right. And then here's your checklist items, right? So like on under contract, I have a checklist of Sorry, 18 I items. So call, if I so click on that. And I was unmuted and I didn't realize. No problem. Um, so under here, right? So you can add tasks in here. And then anytime you move somebody into the um, buyer opportunity stage of under contract, this task list gets assigned to them. And if you click the box for client update, then when you check off those items, it automatically alerts the client that these items have been completed on their behalf or as part of their file. So um, if you wanted to put schedule inspections on here, you could hit client update. And then when you checked it as done, it would update them. So you can take that transaction action flow and put it into each stage of this opportunity and set it up so that anytime you move somebody into that stage, it gives you this checklist of items Did everybody see how I got here to edit this list? No, can you do it again? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I just went to um on your contract. So I went here in the buyers, uh, anywhere inside of cultivate appointment, active under contract, close, like any of these tabbies across the top. It is once you're inside the ones that you, which pulls up the different stages. Here's where you can reorganize your stages. You could delete a stage. You could add a stage. So this is where you edit those steps inside of the under contract. And then here's your checklist items right here in that middle column. So like under financing, I could click that and there's no items. I could click add item. I could click um, confirm CD has been issued. And I can click the little client update button and hit save. <laughs> now, anytime I move anybody into that financing category under the under contract, this task will be assigned to them. And anytime that I check this off, it will update the client that this task has been completed. Um, Amy, so you're, I'm sorry. So you're, you are saying that once we add this one time, it will be there for all of the people that hit that column. Like we won't have to worry about adding it for every opportunity you put in. Correct. To check Correct. This. Okay, once awesome. You add it in this stage, um, inside the edit stages. Now, if you open up a client's file and you're in that opportunity specifically and you just hit add task, it'll add it inside that opportunity, but it won't add it to every file. So you can add specific tasks inside of a client's file inside of opportunities. So instead of using your main task file, if you're like, oh, follow up with Linda tomorrow, you could add that task with a deadline in there. Perfect. Okay, but thank you. The edit stage, yeah, inside the edit stages, it would just do the blanket checklist of what gets assigned as you move them through that process. Awesome. Okay. You may have said this already, but the client update, is that a text or uh, like how does it, it send goes it? Out. It goes out via email. Oh, I see. Okay, thanks. Very cool. And then if I hit edit, um, here's what this edit that task somewhere in your settings you can edit the client updates i want to say it's under your like um let's look we're going to go to my profile and settings While we're waiting for that to load too, keep in mind that as we move through the contract to close process, the transaction doesn't end at the close of escrow. There's things that you want to complete after that and building out your time frame to encompass the post-closing time frame will help you be a more successful agent and grow. So throughout the process, asking for referrals, 
at the end of the process, making sure you ask for reviews, right? We want to make sure we get reviews um, online and all sorts of different places. You can get them on um, Facebook, Yahoo, Google, um, Zillow, Realtor.com. Like there's a bunch of different places that clients can leave reviews for you where people are searching for agents. So that's a great thing to make sure you remember to ask for as we're coming up on the close of escrow. Um, sending out thank you cards, right? To the other agent, to the title company, to the lender, to anybody who was involved in the transaction and just thanking them for their participation just helps to build that relationship because getting offers accepted has a lot to do with relationships. Um, so you just want to make sure that you um, send out those thank you cards. If you're going to send out a client um, gift, right, for the close of escrow, I usually wait on that. I usually wait about a month before I send out my um, client gifts or go do my client gifts because that gives me an opportunity to come by and knock on their door, see how things are going and drop off a gift where oftentimes at the close of escrow, they're getting keys. They're super excited about keys. So giving them a gift at that time is kind of just double. Um, it oftentimes almost gets overlooked, but showing up at their door a month later, making sure they know um, seeing how things are going with the house, seeing how things went with the move, and then showing up with a gift is a good idea. So um, here under, I went to my profile and then settings and then command settings, and then you have client updates. Going, but I'm going to click 20 times. I uh, continue to load. Maybe not thinking really hard, um, but making sure you've got that, that closing time frame. So you'll see on, I don't feel like this is going anywhere. Let's reload it. Give me just a second. So I went uh, command settings, opportunity settings, settings, and then client update, which my, um, my command's not gonna take me there right now. So it's either having a glitch or it's my internet connection. So we'll just let you know that you can go in there and edit that update of how it gets sent out and what, um, what it says there under that client update. We're gonna hop back into this transaction flow. If you look at the bottom of the list down here, I have my post close, right? Make sure we ask for reviews, ask for referrals, send out thank you cards. Um, referral or review follow-up to make sure it was done. Um, send out a review gift card, right? If they left you gift cards or if they left you reviews, maybe you want to send them a thank you gift card to encourage them to give more reviews. Or you could do like a, a monthly drawing for reviews that are done. Um, buyer visit, right? So this was a listing transaction. Hey, I'm going to go visit that buyer. I know what the address is because I sold it and just knock on their door and make sure, you know, deliver that home warranty confirmation page for them. So they remind them that the home warranty is done and make sure everything's good with the house, right? We know that NAR statistics state that most buyers are orphaned after the close of escrow and most do not use the same agent for another transaction. So we want to unorphan our buyers and pick them up as new clients and stay in touch with them. Maybe drop off a card in case they have any questions about the house. They know how to reach us directly and then also deliver that seller gift. Does anybody have any other items they might want to add post close of escrow? How do we stay in contact with our clients or how do we say thank you? How do we help create um, agents that might want to come over to Keller Williams? How do we build those relationships? Um, again, communication is the key. Uh, you can keep in touch with them through various touch points. At the same time, you can like provide them with a list of like contractors, handymen, people they would need on an, for an ongoing maintenance of the house. Uh, you can Absolutely. like provide the trusted list of professionals. I think they really appreciate that. Absolutely. A list of professionals. That's a great idea. That vendor list, right? Providing a vendor referral list, especially if you've got people moving to the area, not just vendor referrals, but maybe even a list of like your favorite restaurants or activities or different things that you can do in the area, right? Who else? What also, are some other things? Also, while, after the escrow is closed while they are moving, uh, if you can help them moving uh, during the moving, some of their friends will be there moving, helping to move. So you can make contact with them and then uh, get some leads. 
Yeah. Even if it's as simple as like, hey, when are you guys loading the moving truck? Let me bring you over pizza, right? Or let me make sure you've got donuts for the movers that morning. Yeah. Right? Something simple as that, even if you don't want to do any heavy lifting, but something like that. What else can we do? Uh, we have a lunch or dinner sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I talked with an agent one time that actually threw the home warming party for the, when they had buyers, they threw the home warming party for them um, a couple weeks after they moved in to introduce and they would invite the neighbors over and their friends. And that gave them an opportunity to, they would bring like the cold cut plate and like the charcuterie board or, you know, whatever over for that home warming party and host it and do all the invitations for them because it gave them the opportunity then to introduce themselves to all the neighbors and to the the client's friends and do the home warming party at the same time, right? So that could be a good idea. Wow. So you meet you, um, agent host the home, um, house warming party for the client. Um, yep. So oh, there was wow. a student that I knew that hosted that, that house warming party for all of her buyers. Wow. <laughs> That's nice. Um, something, Something that recently I came across for sellers, if you're like, hey, what would I do for a seller closing gift that would be nice that you have to be careful mm -hmm. of calling it a gift versus marketing for write-offs to talk to your tax professional. However, um, being that I just recently moved, I hired, I had pre-set up a trash hauler to come to my house at the last day that I was going to be there to haul all my trash away. And it was fabulous knowing I could just take everything I didn't want and throw it in a pile and somebody else would take care of it. So I think now for all of my sellers, that's what I'm going to provide for them is on the day of move out, they have a trash haul so they can just throw it all in a pile. My trash hauler will come and take it all and take it away. No better closing gift, honestly. Like Cutco is fabulous and nice and I usually give Cutco, but I would much rather have that trash haul than a knife. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been to your listings after the sellers leave and the trash can stacked full of stuff, like it can't close and it's overflowing and it's a disaster. So trash haul. <laughs> so you mentioned about the right. gifts. Does anybody have any? Yes. A quick one. So, um, so um, what, what usually what type of gift um, in, in like a gift amount you send it to the buyer? Yeah, what so, do you recommend? Um, so obviously, so talk with your tax professional, but if it's as a gift, as far as a write-off goes, you're limited at like 25 bucks a person for a closing gift. So if it's a family of four, you can spend like a hundred bucks and still have the write-off. If you make it marketing instead of a gift, then you can write off more. Um, so for years now, we've been doing, me and my partner have been doing Cutco because they're branded to us. So it's actually marketing, not a gift. And then we have a Cutco program in place. So like for their first closing, they get one set. And for their second closing, they get a second set. Um, so we're, we're continually building for referrals. They get like the Cutco ice cream scoops and the pie scrapes and all those different, like the pizza cutter. Um, and then, so as they close multiple transactions and refer people to us, they can build their Cutco collection. Um, some people do like gift baskets. Um, so it just varies and depends. Some people do like, oh, I provide the home warranty. That is the closing gift. Some people don't do closing gifts. Um, so it just depends what you want to do and um, what you're comfortable with and what makes sense. The reason we switched, we were doing gift baskets. Um, and the reason we switched over to Cutco, one of the reasons was I had a, we were taking bold one time and our bold coats mentioned that if you do a gift basket valued at $100 for one client and a gift basket valued at $150 for another client, um, it could be seen as discrimination or you don't do one, then it could be seen as discrimination. And so um, just being consistent in what your gifts are to avoid the um, you know lawsuit happy California uh, mentality, I, I just resonated with me, which is why we ended up switching to Cutco and having kind of a system in place because it made it really easy. We didn't have to think about it. We just knew what was going to each person. When they buy and sell, they get two sets. When they sell again, they get the third set. So um, it's just been a really good process that way. So whatever you do, I just say, I would recommend that you kind of systematize it so you know exactly what you need to do because you might be a new agent now with only one or two transactions or no transactions but as you grow your business and you start getting busier and busier you want something that you can maintain and systematize
that's awesome. I like it. That's <laughs> awesome. Yes. Thank you, Amy. You're welcome. Uh, let's see here. I think I covered, I'm not good at following the slides, plot your time frames, transaction management. We talked about that. Um, we talked about communication, right? So we want to make sure we stay in communication with all the other parties. Um, and then we talked about repeat business with um, vendor lists, um, asking for referrals, asking for reviews. And then we talked about, I'm so bad at the slides, um, going into opportunities and creating those checklists and editing stages. Woohoo! I covered it. <laughs> um, oh, you can, did you guys know, have, who's, um, who's taken the time to build out your consumer guide for your app and your website? Anybody? You mean the, uh, the buyer or the seller guide? Yep, the buyer and seller guide. I, I took a stab at the buyer guide. Fabulous. Um, to edit your buyer and seller guide, um, you go into your consumer on the inside of command, the last option on the left-hand side. Oh, look, it finally updated the um, client updates. It finally took me there and I missed it and scooted over. Um, up here at the top, you've got consumer, agent site pages, landing pages, guide builder. Here's where you can build out your buyer and seller guide for your, um, it shows up on your app right here. We just click the three little dots. You can hit edit guide and then you can go in there and edit those steps and edit each thing. The default guide, just so you guys know, the default guide that's on your app um, is not very specific to California. It's just kind of a broad thing. And some of the steps don't really make sense for how we do real estate in the area. So do make sure that you um, go in there and edit that guide and make sure it's up to date. You can change out the pictures. You can change out everything. I actually made mine so that it matches my, um, my buyer's, uh, my seller, my seller presentation and my buyer presentation so that the same thing that I take over to them is also here in that guide. It kind of walks them through the process. Any questions about that buyer or seller guide? Um, so I was not very clear. How do you use that? Like, do you take printouts? Can you have like, can you export it to like a PDF? Um, you cannot export it to a PDF or printouts, but how it works is if you open your Keller Williams app, um, oops, not your command app, your consumer app on your phone, down at the bottom, there's a button called guide. And that's where you'll see the buyer and seller guides on your, um, on your app. And you can share those with clients. So as you enter into contract on a property or start working with a buyer, you can actually go in there and share directly the buyer and seller guide. And they can move through the process and actually kind of check it off as they work through. So it allows them to click on it, get more information, and then check off the steps as they move through the process. But they'll need to have the app installed for, to use it, right? They do need to have the app installed. Yeah. Okay. It's a good, it's a good way to get you to use the app. <laughs> right. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, any other questions with those buyer and seller apps? All right. Give me some ahas from today's session. What are some of your takeaways? All this session is an aha. <laughs> Make it <I> simple. <laughs> the session itself. Yeah, Perfect. I love this section. Good. A lot of you. Communication is the key. Communication is the key. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Just seeing all your tools, Amy, was really insightful. So we could see how to put it to practice. Yeah, a lot of good material. Good. good, yeah, start now, right? When you don't have very many transactions going on of solidifying mm. the process, getting your command set up, setting up those buyer and seller guides so that as you get busier and busier, you just it just becomes a systematic process that you can just move through really easily and keep track of everything and keep everybody updated. It'll work like magic. 
All right, daily success habits. Um, make sure you're adding your 10 contacts a day to command. Make sure you're having those 10 conversations about real estate today. Um, send out those 10 handwritten notes. In case you're struggling with that, a good way to do that is like those 10 conversations that you had about real estate. Send them, send them out a card, right? That's really easy. Um, and then preview those, um, those new homes on the market. Make sure you know what's on the market. So as you have conversations about real estate and they're like, oh, I was looking for a home with a pool. You can be like, oh, actually there was a new home that just came on the market today. Beautiful home, about 2,500 square feet, had a gorgeous pool. Um, would you like to see it, right? We just want to know what's on the market so that as we're having those conversations, we can speak intelligently about what's on the market and what's going on with the market. Um, I really appreciate everybody joining me today. It's about 10, 18, so I went over. I apologize. Does anybody have any questions at all about today's session um, that you wanted me to go deeper on? Hey, Amy. Yes. Um, I, I, I'm making my buyer's guide, and I have reached only 12 steps. Uh -huh. And you are 18 steps. So I'm kind of thinking, what is it that I'm missing in in that? So if you don't mind, can I just quickly have a look at it? Or You can. In fact, let's see if it's, um, let me just see, because I think it's on my website. Let's look. And you share this by sharing your KW app, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So here... Um, if you go to my website, which is amypetard.kw.com, I can't speak anymore. Um, if you go to guides, you'll see my home buying guides up there. Oh. Um, and then as you, so it'll walk you through each step. It's got financing or cash, getting pre-approved, start your search, touring homes, making an offer, offer negotiation, accepted contract, the good faith deposit, home insurance, contingencies, um, investigation and inspections, repairs, home warranty, the loan process, title and escrow, the final five days, and other facts, and then congrats. And as you click on each one of those, it goes further into detail. But you're welcome to go to my website and kind of mess with those and look at what I've put on there. Um, like I said, that one, the buyer's guide really matches up with my buyer presentation, kind of what we walked through during that time period. <clears throat> And is this the only buyer's guide that you use or is, is there any other? Do you always have, go through this? No, I have a PDF version of this as well that I've created. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then there's also the selling guide there. I don't think I've spent as much time on the selling guide. Preparing your home, staging, photography, showing, reviewing, inspections, appraisal, and then close. So it's not quite as in-depth. So yeah, absolutely. But again, that's Amy Pittard. It's A-M-Y-P-I-T-T-A-R-D dot K-W dot com. That's awesome. Thank you, Amy. Absolutely. Any other questions about today's session? And like I said, I'll get you um, the appraisal information, the checklist, um, the buyer intro email. I'll make sure those all go out to everybody who is registered for mm -hmm. Ignite. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Looking so forward to more classes from you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I love your class. Thank you. All right. Have a fabulous day. You too. You too. Thanks. Thank you.